Chapter Four of the Law and Medical Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Law and Medical Men by Robert Vashon Rogers. Who may practice? The law has nothing to do with the merits of particular systems or schools of medicine. Their relative merits may become the subject of inquiry when the skill or ability of a practitioner in any given case is to be passed upon as a matter of fact. But the law does not and cannot supply any positive rules for the interpretation of medical science. It is not one of those certain or exact sciences in which truths become established and fixed, but it is essentially progressive in its nature. No one system of practice has been uniformly followed, but physicians, from the days of Hippocrates, have been divided into opposing sects and schools. The sects of the dogmatists and the empires divided the ancient world for centuries until the rise of the methodics who in their turn gave way to innumerable sects theories of practice believed to be infallible in one age have been utterly rejected in another for thirteen centuries europe yielded to the authority of galen he was implicitly followed his practice strictly pursued everything that seemed to conflict with his precepts was rejected and yet in the revolutions of medical opinion the works of this undoubtedly great man were publicly burned by parcelius and his disciples and for centuries following the medical world was divided between the galenists and the chemists until a complete ascendancy over both was obtained by the vilists this state of things has been occasioned by the circumstance that medical practitioners have often been more given to the formation of theories upon the nature of disease and the mode of its treatment than to that careful observation and patient accumulation of facts by which in other sciences the phenomena of nature have been unravelled it is not to be overlooked that as an art it has been characterized in a greater degree by fluctuations of opinion as to its principles and the mode of its practice than perhaps any other pursuit that it has been distinguished by the constant promulgation and explosion of theories that it has all alternated between the advancement of new doctrines and the revival of old ones and that its professors in every age have been noted for the tenacity with which they have clung to opinions and the unanimity with which they have resisted the introduction of valuable discoveries they still continue to disagree in respect to the treatment of diseases as old as the human race and at the present day a radical and fundamental difference divides the allopathists from the followers of hanuman to say nothing of those believe in the sovereign instrumentality the axiom that doctors differ is as true now as ever it was thus spake daily j the reporter observes in a note it may perhaps be safely questioned whether the sister sciences of law and theology present any such unity or certainty of opinion as might enable them to arraign the medical profession in great britain and ireland since the passing of the medical act of eighteen fifty eight every one registered under the provisions of that act is entitled according to his qualification to practice medicine or surgery or both as the case may be in any part of her majesty's dominions and to recover on any court of law should any patient neglect to pay 
his reasonable charges for professional aid advice and visits and the cost of any medicine or other medical or surgical appliances rendered or supplied by him to his patient but any one not so registered cannot recover any such charges in any court of law proof of registration is absolutely necessary for a recovery but it will suffice if the registration has taken place before the trial and as to who may be registered the act says any one may be who is a fellow member licensate or extra licensate of the royal college of physicians of london or of the royal college of physicians of edinburgh or of the king and queen's college of ireland or fellow member or licensate in midwifery of the royal college of surgeons of england or fellow or licensate of the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh or of the faculty of physicians and surgeons of glasgow or of the society of apothecaries london or of the apothecaries hall dublin or doctor bachelor or licensate of medicine of any university of the united kingdom or licensate in surgery of any university in ireland or doctor of medicine by doctorate granted prior to august eighteen fifty eight by the archbishop of canterbury or doctor of medicine of any foreign or colonial college after examination or who satisfies the council of education and registration that there is sufficient reason for admitting him to be registered in france the medical profession is divided into two grades in the higher grade are all doctors of medicine of the universities those in the lower grade are officers de sante in germany the right to practice is conferred by a state license granted on passing the stats examine the degree of doctor of medicine is almost always taken at some university after obtaining the state license in austria the right to practice is carried by the degree of doctor of medicine obtained from a university the legislature of every colony of great britain has full power to make laws for the purpose of enforcing the registration within its jurisdiction of medical practitioners including those registered under the imperial act in ontario the medical profession is incorporated under the name and style of the college of physicians and surgeons of ontario and every person registered under the provisions of the ontario medical act is a member of the college there is a council in part appointed by certain educational institutions in part elected by practitioners this council fixes the curriculum of the studies appoints examiners and arranges the examinations of those desirous of admission to practice it also arranges for the registration of those who pass the examinations or had certain qualifications before july eighteen seventy every one who passes the examinations and has compiled with the rules and regulations of the council and paid his fees is entitled to registration and by virtue thereof to practice medicine surgery and midwifery in the province if registration is not granted to one he may compel it by a writ of madness registration is essential to entitle a practitioner to recover any charges for medical or surgical advice or for attendance or for performance of any operation or for any medicine he may have prescribed or supplied this last clause does not apply to any licensed chemist or druggist and if any one unregistered for hire gain or hope of reward practices or professes to practice medicine surgery or midwifery or advertises to give advice therein 
he is liable to a fine of from twenty five dollars to one hundred dollars and any one not registered who takes or uses any name title addition or description implying or calculated to lead people to infer that he is registered or that he is recognized by law as a physician surgeon accouchee or licensate in medicine surgery or midwifery is liable to the same penalty any person who willfully or falsely pretends to be a physician doctor of medicine surgeon or general practitioner or assumes any title addition or description other than he actually possesses and legally entitled to is liable to a fine from ten dollars to fifty dollars but it is not punishable to practice for love or charity and any one who has the degree of doctor of medicine may place letters m d after his name even though he is not a registered practitioner if he do not act as such for hire or gain while one partner was registered and the other was not and there was painted on the sign after the name of the first m d m c p and s o n t and after the name of the other only m d it was held that the use of the simple letters m d in contradistinction to the full titles of the partner on the same sign was not the use of a title calculated to lead people to infer registration and that the unregistered partner was not guilty of an offence under the act in ontario provision is made for the registration of homeopathists as well as of regular practitioners and as for the eclectics who were practicing in the province for six years before eighteen seventy four a physician practicing in another country and performing medical services for a patient then residing there may recover his fees in this province notwithstanding he is not registered a medical practitioner duly registered in england under the imperial act is entitled in ontario to registration upon payment of fees without examination in the united states the common law doctrine which favors the right of every man to practice in any profession or business in which he is competent prevails to a great extent and medicine being regarded by it as an honorific profession no apprenticeship was required but the practitioner always prescribed at his peril this was also the doctrine of the civil law which drew no barriers around either law or medicine any one who pleased might practise them without any previous qualification subject always to responsibility for injury inflicted upon others in the absence of any statutes therefore limiting the common law right to practise medicine inherent in every person the term physician may there be applied to any one who publicly announces himself to be a practitioner of the art and undertakes to treat the sick either for or without reward the common law knows nothing of systems or schools of medicine in its eyes eclectic botanic physiomedical electrical thompsonian homeopath reformed indian doctor cancer doctor indian opathist clairvoyant doctor and regular physician are alike the scales of justice are no more affected by the large doses of the allopathist than by the infinitesimal supplies of the homeopathist but the law will sometimes interfere where one not pretending to be a practicing physician uses a particular system in his own family a father during the sickness of his children and wife refused to provide any medical treatment except that applied by himself called the bronchite system 
which consists in pricking the skin of the patient in different parts of the body with an instrument armed with a number of needles and operated by a spring and then rubbing the parts affected with an irritating oil the wife and three children had died within a month the man practiced this exanthemic treatment upon them but did not even call in physicians who used that mode the superior court of pennsylvania deprived this believer in the bronchite pansia of the custody of his surviving children before the common law every one undertaking to treat the sick professionally and as the exercise of his vocation is legally a physician he has the rights of one and when he assumes those rights the law lays upon him the heavy burdens and responsibilities of the profession it is of course far otherwise if any statute prescribes particular qualifications for the practice of the profession and one undertakes to discharge its duties without such qualifications then he is doubly a wrongdoer first as against the statute and second as against the public who have a right to demand in him the ordinary proficiency of his profession in arkansas california connecticut kentucky maryland massachusetts michigan mississippi missouri new jersey texas and vermont there appear to be no statutory requirements regulating the practice of physicians or surgeons in virginia the practitioner only needs a license in alabama florida georgia louisiana maine minnesota ohio and wisconsin a practitioner must either have a license from a medical board or society constituted according to the law of the respective states or else be a graduate of a medical college in south carolina and the district of columbia he must be licensed by the medical board so too in delaware but this rule in delaware does not apply to those who practice exclusively the thompsonian or botanic or homeopathic systems or practice gratuitously or for what is willingly given them in new york state early in the century that no one practicing physic or surgery without a license could collect any debts incurred by such practice and it was a penal offense so to practice in eighteen thirty the unauthorized practice of physic or surgery was made a misdemeanor punishable by fine or imprisonment or both shortly afterwards the offence was made penal instead of criminal and it was declared the provisions should not extend to any one using or applying for the benefit of any sick person or any roots barks or herbs the growth or produce of the united states in eighteen forty four all laws limiting the right to practice medicine or surgery were repealed free trade in physic prevailed all examinations certificates and licenses were declared unnecessary the repealing act expressly permitted any person to practice physic subject to punishment as for a misdemeanor if he should be convicted of gross ignorance malpractice or immoral conduct however a change came and in eighteen seventy four the legislator declared that it was a misdemeanor for any person to practice medicine or surgery in the state of new york unless authorized to do so by a license or diploma from some chartered school state board of medical examiners or medical society or to practice under cover of a medical diploma illegally obtained the penalty for the first offence is a fine of not more than two hundred dollars for a subsequent offence a fine of from one hundred to five hundred dollars or imprisonment for not less than thirty days or both 
in 1880 it was further enacted that no person shall practice physic or surgery within the state unless he is twenty-one years of age and has been heretofore authorized so to do pursuant to the laws in force at the time of his authorization or is hereafter authorized so to do either by license from the regents of the university of the state of new york a diploma of an incorporated medical college within the state or of one without the state approved of by some proper medical facility within the state every physician or surgeon except those who had been practicing ten years before eighteen eighty and a few others had to register with the clerk of the county where he practiced his name residence place of birth together with his authority to practice after the repeal of the old medical acts and before the enactment of the law of eighteen seventy four the new york court of common pleas had to define who was a physician or doctor and it said the words simply meant a person who made it his business to practice physic and it was wholly immaterial to what school of medicine he belonged or whether he belonged to any the legal signification of the term doctor means simply a practitioner of physic the system pursued is immaterial the law has nothing to do with the merits of particular systems the point came up in considering a case where an agreement of employment between an opera director and a vocalist provided for the forfeiture of a month's salary in case the latter should fail to attend at any stated performance except in the case of sickness certified to by a doctor to be appointed by the director the director appointed dr quinn a homeopathist signor corsi the baritone had a bad cold and a sore throat but would not consult dr quinn and proffered a certificate of an allopathist of his own choosing this max marizic would not take and he refused to pay corsi his salary the singer sued but the court held that the provision was binding upon the artist although the director had appointed a person in the practice of what is known as the homeopathic system of medicine the court considered it was error to attempt in the then present state of medical science to recognize as a matter of law any one system of practice or to declare that the practitioner who follows a particular system is a doctor and that one who pursues a different method is not it has been held however that where a regular physician is spoken of an allopathic is meant in iowa the court said as yet there is no particular system of medicine established or favored by the laws of iowa and as no system is upheld none is prohibited the regular the botanic the homeopathic the hydropathic and other modes are all like unprohibited though the regular system has been advancing as a science for centuries aided by research and experiment by experience and skill still the law regards it with no partiality or distinguishing favor nor is it recognized as the exclusive standard or test by which the other systems are to be adjudged notwithstanding the new york law of 1874 one can undertake to effect cures by manipulation without possessing a diploma he may even maintain an action for the compensation agreed upon although not a graduate and having no license to practice a man professed to cure by rubbing kneading and pressing the body the court considered his system was rather one of nursing than of either medicine or surgery 
and that it could not result in any injury to the person practised upon than that of possible financial loss yet in maine where a license is required even a medical clairvoyant was held to come within the statute and it was decided that he could not render his professional services without having the legal permission in england an unregistered person sued to recover his charges for galvanic operations and for materials and electric fluid used therein the jury decided in favor of the galvanizer and the court would not disturb the verdict as the work was done before the act of eighteen fifty eight came into operation but expressed a strong opinion that if the work had not been done when it was it would have been impossible to hold that the case did not fall within the statute a physician must practice according to the principles of its school there are distinct and different schools of practice allopathic or old school homeopathic thompsonian hydropathic or water cure and if a physician of one of those schools is called in his treatment is to be tested by the general doctrines of his school not by those of other schools it is presumed that patient and physician both understand this a person professing to follow one system of medical treatment cannot be expected by his employer to practice another while the regular physician is expected to follow the rules of the old school in the art of curing the botanic physician must be equally expected to adhere to his adopted method while on the part of every medical practitioner the law implies an undertaking that he will use an ordinary degree of care and skill in medical operations and that he is unquestionably liable for gross carelessness or unskilfulness in the management of his patients still the person who employs a botanic practitioner has no right to expect the same kind of treatment or the same kind of medicine that a regular physician would administer the law does not require a man to accomplish more than he undertakes nor in a different manner from what he professes so if one is employed as a botanic physician and performs his services with ordinary care and skill in accordance with the system he professes to follow that will be regarded as a legal defence to a suit for malpractice it would show a full compliance with his profession and undertaking and if injury resulted to the plaintiff he could blame no one but himself if a patient had not been deluded by any but himself and voluntarily employs in one art a man who openly exercises another his folly has no claim to indulgence the old mahomedan case cited by puffendorf with approbation is very much to the point a man who had a disorder in his eyes called on a farrier for a remedy this worthy gave him a remedy commonly used by his quadrupedal patients the man lost his sight and brought an action against the farrier for damages but the judge said no action would lie for if the complainant had not himself been an ass he would never have employed a horse doctor but when a case the converse of this came up the court remarked that stock and the human family are animals with many similitudes and some variances so that although it be admitted that one acquainted with the mode of treating diseases of the human family should not be relied on to select from the materia medica substances apt for the treatment of stock still we think it clear that one having a scientific knowledge of the diseases of men must be presumed to have so much knowledge of the diseases 
of a mule as to enable him to determine whether a disease with which the animal is afflicted be of recent or long standing an expert in the diseases of man is necessarily an expert in the diseases of animals so as to make his opinion competent evidence upon a matter in reference to which he will swear that his scientific knowledge has enabled him to form an opinion and so a physician was allowed to give his opinion as to whether the disease with which a mule was affected was or was not of long standing as he considered himself competent so to do from his knowledge of the diseases to which human flesh is hair although he knew nothing in particular about the diseases of stock as one who employs a homeopathic or botanic physician knowingly cannot object to his bill because he was not treated in the way usual among orthodox practitioners so on the other hand if a physician of one school is employed by one who has a penchant for that particular system and treats his patients according to a different system he cannot recover for his services if he fail to benefit the patient proof that one practices physic is prima facie evidence of his professional character and if one holds himself out as a physician and surgeon and acts as such the law will hold him liable as such a physician who merely casually makes up a prescription for a friend when meeting him upon the street cannot be called his medical attendant that term means one to whose care a sick person has been confided end of chapter four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section five of the law and medical men this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ian stewart rosanna victoria australia the law and medical men by robert vachon rogers section five chapter five negligence and malpractice malpractice or malapraxis may be defined to be an improper discharge of professional duties either through want of skill or negligence it is now more particularly applied to torts when committed by a physician surgeon or apothecary it is a great misdemeanor and offence at common law whether it arise from curiosity and experiment or from neglect because it breaks the trust which the party has placed in the physician tending directly to his destruction a medical man who is guilty of gross negligence or evinces a gross ignorance of his profession is criminally responsible for the consequences and one who by a culpable want of care and attention or by the absence of a competent degree of skill and knowledge causes injury to a patient is liable to a civil action for damages unless indeed such injury be the immediate result of intervening negligence on the part of the patient himself or unless such patient has by his own carelessness directly conduced to such injury it is sometimes difficult to distinguish between civil and criminal malpractice or to say when one is criminally and when only civilly responsible but it may be said generally that to constitute criminal liability there must be such a degree of complete negligence in the practice as the law means by the word felonious there may be malpractice by commission that is from the want of ordinary skill in the discharge of professional duties or malpractice by omission that is from negligence in the discharge of such duties the question was their negligence will be answered from the standpoint of the law not from that of medicine when a matter comes to be judicially investigated the law as applicable to other professions and occupations will be applied to the medical or surgical case under consideration 
Strictly speaking, the term negligence is limited in its application to carelessness in the performance of professional duty. Carelessness is its proper synonym. Duties performed without care, caution, attention, diligence, skill, prudence or judgment are negligently performed. Acts are so designated which are performed by one heedlessly, even when there is no purpose to omit the performance of duty. It is non-feasance, not malfeasance. It is the omitting to do and not the ill-doing. It is the leaving undone what one ought to have done, not the doing what one ought not to have done, this last being a want of skill. In its various degrees it ranges between simple accident and actual fraud, the latter beginning where negligence ends. Wharton, after criticising various definitions, proposes this. Negligence, in its civil relations, is such an inadvertent imperfection by a responsible human agent in the discharge of a legal duty as immediately produces in an ordinary and natural sequence a damage to another. Negligence in medical practice is a violation of the obligation that medical men impliedly enter into when they accept the charge of a patient. Such obligation enjoins care and caution in what they do, and in what they omit to do. A medical man is liable as well for want of skill as for negligence, and an injured party may bring his action to recover for damage resulting from ignorance and carelessness, and recover on proving that he sustained damage from either. Physicians and surgeons have specified duties imposed upon them when they undertake the charge of a patient. Refusing to perform their part of the implied contract will constitute negligence, and for all injury resulting therefrom they will be held accountable. It will constitute a tort for which the law gives damages. Of course, a medical man, unless he be an officer of the government, charged with specific duties which he thereby violates, has a legal right to decline to take charge of a particular case. When in charge, however, he is liable for any negligence, whether of omission or commission, which may produce injury to his patient. Voluntatis est suscipere mandatum necessitas est consumare. There is an implied obligation on a man holding himself out to the community as a physician and surgeon, and practising his profession, that he should possess the ordinary skill requisite for reasonable success, and that he should attend to the case with due care. If the patient knows of the practitioner's want of skill, he cannot complain of the lack of that which he knew did not exist. A surgeon does not become an actual insurer. The implied contract is not to cure, but to possess and employ in the treatment of the case such reasonable skill and diligence as are ordinarily exercised by thoroughly educated surgeons. And in judging of the degree of skill and attention required, regard is to be had to the time and place. The law implies that in the treatment of all cases which they undertake, medical men will exercise reasonable and ordinary care and diligence. They are bound always to use their best skill and judgment in determining the nature of the malady and the best mode of treatment, and in all respects to do their best to secure a perfect restoration of their patients to health and soundness. But they do not impliedly warrant the recovery of their patients, and are not liable on account of any failure in that respect, unless it is through some default of their own. Tyndall, C.J., in summing up to the jury in an action for improper treatment to a hand and wrist, whereby the plaintiff lost the use of her hand, well said, Every person who enters into a learned profession undertakes to bring to the exercise of it a reasonable degree of care and skill. He does not undertake, if he is a surgeon, that he will perform a cure, nor does he undertake to use the highest possible degree of skill. There may be persons who have higher education and greater advantages than he has, but he undertakes to bring a fair, reasonable and competent degree of skill. Wharton and Stilly thus state the law. A physician and surgeon is only responsible for ordinary skill, etc., and for the exercise of his best judgment in matters of doubt. He is not accountable for a want of the highest degree of skill, nor for an erroneous, though honest, conclusion, according to his best light. The law has no allowance for quackery. It demands qualification in the profession practised, not extraordinary skill such as belongs to few men 
of rare genius and endowment but that degree which ordinarily characterizes the profession and in determining whether the practitioner possesses ordinary skill regard must be had to the advanced state of the profession at the time as to what is ordinary or reasonable skill or care the rule has sometimes been laid down thus favorably the least amount of skill with which a fair proportion of the practitioners of a given locality are endowed is to be taken as the criterion by which to judge the physician's skill or ability or as another writer puts it it has been finally determined to consider the least amount of skill compatible with the scientific knowledge of the healing art as sufficient to predicate the existence of ordinary skill to render a medical man liable even civilly for negligence or want of due care or skill it is not enough that there has been a less degree of skill than some other medical man may have shown or a less degree of care than even he himself might have bestowed nor is it enough that he himself acknowledges some degree of want of care there must have been a want of competent and ordinary care and skill and to such a degree as to have led to a bad result in a city there are many means of professional culture which are inaccessible in the country hospitals can be walked libraries visited new books and appliances bought constant intercourse had with the greater lights of the profession what is due diligence therefore in the city is not due diligence in the country and what is due diligence in the country is not due diligence in the city hence the question in each particular case is to be determined not by inquiring what would be the average diligence or skill of the profession which would be a thing very difficult to reach but what would be the diligence or skill of an honest intelligent and responsible practitioner in the position in which the one in question was placed the skill required is not an absolute but a relative qualification and as such therefore always subordinated to whatever conventional standard of professional proficiency we may choose to adopt like morals it may vary with times and places or if based upon representative intellects it is clear that the ideal type selected must be one to which the majority rather than the minority of minds approximate a physician when called upon to manage a case is not required to apply the skill and care which could be applied by the perfect ideal physician for the reason that from the limitation of the human intellect no perfect ideal physician exists in practice and from the limitation of human endurance no perfect ideal physician even if he existed could watch a patient unintermittingly but a physician when called upon to manage a case is bound to exercise the skill and vigilance which good and faithful physicians under the circumstances in which he is placed would exercise if called upon in a country town remote from the great centres of scientific activity to attend to an exceptional case which requires immediate action he is not liable if he does not employ those mechanisms which only a residence in such a centre of scientific activity would enable him to procure on the other hand a physician living in such a centre is liable for negligence if when called upon in such a case he does not use such mechanism supposing its application to be advisable a physician and surgeon is bound to possess the ordinary skill learning and experience of his profession generally at the time in similar localities and with similar opportunities for experience a patient is entitled to the benefit of the increased knowledge of the day the physician or surgeon who assumes to exercise the healing art is bound to be up in the improvements of the day the standard of ordinary skill is on the advance and he who would not be found wanting must apply himself with all due diligence to the most accredited sources of knowledge sex is no excuse for negligence there is no rule of law to the effect that less care is required of a woman than a man a lady physician cannot as such claim any privilege of exemption from the care and caution required of men any more than a woman acting as a locomotive engineer would be allowed to use less diligence to avoid mischief to others that men must use male and female are governed by the same rule in this respect the rule of prudent regard for the rights of others knows nothing of sex 
inasmuch as gratuitous services are more generally rendered by young and inexperienced physicians than by those who are well established in their business a presumption naturally arises that one who renders such services is not possessed of great skill and was not supposed to be by the patient this presumption may be overcome by proof to the contrary and the physician must be judged by the standard to which he led the patient to believe he had attained or if he has done nothing to mislead his patient upon this point his responsibility will be measured by the degree of skill which he is proved actually to possess it has been laid down in maine that physicians and surgeons who offer themselves to the public as practitioners impliedly promise thereby that they possess the requisite skill and knowledge to enable them to heal such cases as they undertake with reasonable success and that this rule does not require the possession of the highest or even the average skill knowledge and experience but only such as will enable them to treat the case understandingly and safely considering how much the treatment of a case depends upon its varying phases which change as quickly as the shifting hues of the heavens it is hard for one medical man to come forward and condemn the treatment of a brother in the profession and to say he would have done this or that when probably had he been in a position to judge of the case from the first he would have done no better if a physician does not bring to the treatment of an injury or of a disease the ordinary amount of skill possessed by those in his profession it is immaterial how high his standing may be if he has skill and does not apply it he is guilty of negligence and if he does not have it then he is liable for the want of it when a case of alleged malpractice is before the court the questions to be considered are did the defendant possess the ordinary skill of persons acting as medical men if he did was he chargeable in not applying it in the treatment of the patient whether he possessed greater skill or had been successful in the treatment of other patients is wholly immaterial where the point in issue is whether skill was applied in a given case the possession of skill without proof that it was applied will be no defence the law punishes negligence no less than want of skill it is undoubtedly true that the physician is the best judge of the degree of attention which any case requires nor is it in the omission to make a given number of visits that negligence resides but whenever any important step in the treatment of disease is neglected or any important stage of it overlooked which might have been used for the benefit of the patient then it may be averred that the physician has been guilty of negligence however assiduous he may otherwise have been at different periods of his treatment skill and diligence may be considered therefore as indissolubly associated since skill judges of the measure of diligence required and also furnishes the latter with the eyes of observation and the hands of execution while diligence on her part gives cumulative power to skill and leaves no link wanting in the continuous train of treatment the measure of skill which a physician is bound to exercise is not affected by his refusal of the proffer of assistance from other medical men the court said that such a refusal is no more than an implied declaration of ability to treat the case properly by assuming and continuing the charge of the patient the physician is under an obligation to exercise a degree of skill which is neither increased or diminished by such refusal in considering the skill and knowledge of a practitioner regard must be had to the school to which he professes to belong and where there is no particular system established or favoured by law and no system is prohibited every physician is expected to practise according to his professed and avowed system a botanic physician is to be gauged according to the botanic system and a homeopathic physician by the homeopathic system so if a botanic doctor or a homeopathist is sued for malpractice he may free himself from blame by showing that his practice was according to the rules of the school which he professed and was known to follow and a departure from the received canons of his system will be taken as a want of ordinary skill but the jury is not to judge by determining which school in their own view is best a sign or other proof that one actually practices physic or surgery is prima facie evidence of his professional character and when a physician's skill is at issue he may adduce evidence to prove the existence of such general skill on his part irrespective of the particular case as to which the question arises and he may show this by the testimony of those in his profession who can speak from personal knowledge of his practice the possession of a medical diploma is prima facie of ordinary skill but of course it must be shown that the college from which it emanated had authority to grant degrees in medicine 
If, in the absence of a medical man, a non-professional person is called in to assist a person taken suddenly sick, such amateur is not liable for special or slight negligence. That is for the lack of that diligence and skill belonging to a professed physician. But he is liable for gross negligence, the culpa lata of the Latinists. That is, the lack of the diligence and skill belonging to ordinary, unprofessional persons of common sense while, as we have seen, the physician is liable for slight negligence, culpa levis, if he either undertakes the case without the ordinary qualifications of a physician under such circumstances, or manages it without the ordinary skill of such a physician. If a physician treats a patient without being requested to do so, he is held to a more strict account than in ordinary cases. In one instance, a medical man administered physic to a slave without the owner's consent, and the court held him responsible for all the evil consequences which resulted. And this rule is still more rigidly enforced when the volunteer, by his officiousness, excludes a competent practitioner who would have been otherwise obtainable. If one who is not a regular medical practitioner professes to deal with the life and health of others, he is bound to have and employ competent skill. The mere fact that he renders his services gratuitously or out of charity does not free the practitioner from all liability, but according to some authorities the attendant in such cases is held to a less strict accountability than when his services are based upon an implied contract, and is liable only for gross negligence. Amos, in his Science of Law, says, The less the payment made in return for diligence, the less the diligence that is expected. And if no payment at all is made, as little diligence as possible is usually expected, though it may be that some is. Wharton cannot accept this doctrine from humane and other considerations. And Audrinos says that it may be considered as a received principle of law that a physician, though rendering his services gratuitously, as in hospitals or among the outdoor poor, is bound to exhibit the same degree of ordinary skill and diligence in the treatment of a patient as if he were acting under the incentive of a consideration or prospective reward. If he undertakes to execute the trust reposed in him, he is bound to do it well, or else he may be compelled to respond in damages to the party injured by his misfeasance. It is not the consideration which constitutes the foundation of his responsibility, but the fact that in voluntarily accepting the mandate, spondet peritium artis, indiscriminately to all, he cannot apportion medical skill or his diligence to meet the prospective emoluments flowing out of any given case. In a criminal case, Denman J. told the jury that it made no difference whether a medical man was dealing with a patient or acting as a volunteer and dealing with a friend or with his own wife. But Cockburn, C.J., in a case where a patient in a hospital sued two surgeons for injury received from being scalded in a bath, in which he had been placed by the nurses on the orders of the surgeons, said no doubt persons who went as patients into hospitals were not to be treated with negligence. But, on the other hand, medical gentlemen who gave their services gratuitously were not to be made liable for negligence for which they were not personally responsible. The jury gave a verdict in favour of the doctors. If a sick man applies to one not a physician for gratuitous medical assistance, and this one either does not exert all his skill or administers improper medicine to the best of his ability, he is not liable for damage. The amount of prudence which a man must exercise in selecting a physician and the means to be cured is the same that any prudent and reasonable man would do in any other matter. It is the duty of a patient to cooperate with his medical adviser and to conform to the necessary prescriptions, and if, under the pressure of pain, he does not, or if, by refusing to adopt the remedies of the physician, he frustrates the latter's endeavours, or if he aggravates the case by his own misconduct, he cannot charge against the physician the consequences due distinctively to himself, for no one can take advantage of his own wrong. In such a case, even if the physician's treatment was objectionable, he can only recover nominal damages, and if the injury was due to the patient's fractiousness and disregard of the doctor's orders, the latter being judicious, no action at all will lie. In Ohio, it was held that, in an action for malpractice in the treatment of a swollen ankle and diseased foot, the judge had not erred in saying to the jury, 
if you find that the defendant directed the plaintiff to observe absolute rest as a part of the treatment to his foot and that direction was such as a surgeon or physician of ordinary skill would adopt or sanction and the patient negligently failed to observe such direction or purposely disobeyed the same and that such negligence or disobedience approximately contributed to the injury of which he complains he cannot recover in this action although he may prove that the defendant's negligence and want of skill also contributed to the injury. The injured party must not have contributed at all. The information given by a surgeon to his patient concerning the nature of his malady is a circumstance that should be considered in determining whether the patient, in disobeying the instructions of the surgeon, was guilty of negligence or not. The general doctrine of contributory negligence is this that although there may have been negligence on the part of the plaintiff, yet, unless he might, by the exercise of ordinary care, have avoided the consequence of the defendant's negligence, he is entitled to recover. If, by ordinary care, he might have avoided it, then he is the author of his own wrong. The rule is laid down in another case, as follows. If it is impossible to separate the injury occasioned by the plaintiff from that occasioned by the neglect of the defendant, the plaintiff cannot recover. If, however, they can be separated, for such injury as the plaintiff may show thus proceeded solely from the want of ordinary skill or ordinary care of the defendant, he may recover. The patient must exercise ordinary care and prudence. He is not bound to observe the utmost possible caution. And the ordinary care required has been defined to be that degree of care which persons of ordinary care and prudence are accustomed to use and employ under similar circumstances. In fact, the plaintiff must use his own senses. Still, if he is rash and negligent, and yet the physician has been so very neglectful that ordinary care on the part of the patient would not have prevented the unfortunate result, the plaintiff will be entitled to recover damages. So, where the doctor's negligence is the approximate cause of the injury, and that of the patient only the remote cause, and proximate does not mean the first or nearest in order of time, but the first or nearest in order of cause. It is to be remembered that a physician may be called to prescribe for cases which originated in the carelessness of the patient, and though such carelessness would remotely contribute to the injury sued for, it would not relieve the physician from liability for his distinct negligence, and the separate injury occasioned thereby. The patient may also, while he is under treatment, injure himself by his own carelessness, yet he may recover of the physician if he carelessly or unskillfully treats him afterwards, and thus does him a distinct injury. The burden of proving that the plaintiff's own negligence contributed to the injury rests upon the defendant. Evidence that the patient requested the defendants to perform an operation or do an act which caused the injury does not tend to prove contributory negligence, if the injury was not the natural result of such act carefully performed. If the patient is insane and so incapable of cooperating with the physician, contributory negligence is not imputable, and this inability the physician is bound to take into account. If the physician has injured the patient by his negligence, the refusal of the patient or his custodian to allow an experiment by another physician to repair the injury is not contributory negligence, unless he had reasonable assurance of the success of the experiment. The practitioner is liable where a patient suffers from his want of ordinary skill and diligence, even though the carelessness of those nursing the patient may have aggravated the case and rendered the ultimate condition of the patient worse than it otherwise would have been. Although this carelessness in nursing may be proved in mitigation of the damages sought against the physician, it will not serve to bar the right of action. And where two surgeons who gave their services gratuitously to the sick in a hospital were sued by one Perianovsky for maltreatment, thereby causing him to be placed in a bath so hot that he was scalded and injured, and it was proved that the bath, though ordered by the defendants, was actually administered by the nurses, and that the defendants were not present when it was given, and that it was no part of their duty personally to superintend such things, Coburn C.J., in summing up, told the jury that the surgeons would not be liable for the neglect of the nurses unless near enough to be aware of it and to prevent it. And in another case, the court held that if a jury were to find that the parents of the patient, a boy, were in charge of and nursed him during his sickness, and that they did not obey the directions of the physician in regard to the treatment and care of their son during such time, 
but disregarded the same and thereby contributed to the several injuries of which he complains he could not recover if the injuries were the result of mutual and concurring neglect of the parties no action to recover damages therefore will lie the medical man has oft times to sail between scylla and charybdis while on the one hand he is bound to consult the attainable literature in his profession and to diligently gather in for every case he undertakes to treat the experience of his confreres for in determining what is negligence the improvements that are constantly taking place are always considered at the same time he must not try new modes or methods too readily lest a judge say of him as one said in a surgery case it appears from the evidence of the surgeons that it was improper to disunite the callus without consent this is the usage and law of surgeons then it was ignorance and unskilfulness in that very particular to do contrary to the rule of the profession what no surgeon ought to have done for anything that appears to the court this was the first experiment made with this new instrument and if it was it was a rash action and he who acts rashly acts ignorantly and although the defendants a surgeon and an apothecary in general may be as skilful in their prospective professions as any two gentlemen in england yet the court cannot help saying that in this particular case they acted ignorantly and unskilfully contrary to the known rule and usage of surgeons and they had to pay the plaintiff five hundred pounds for the damage to his leg success is the only thing that justifies an innovation either in politics or physic when it is proved that the physician has omitted altogether the established mode of treatment and has adopted one that has proved to be injurious evidence of skill or of reputation for skill is wholly immaterial except to show what the law presumes that he possesses the ordinary degree of skill of persons engaged in the same profession in such a case it is of no consequence how much skill he may have he has demonstrated a want of it in the treatment of the particular case the failure to use skill if the surgeon has it may be negligence but when the treatment adopted is not in accordance with the established practice but is positively injurious the case is not one of negligence but of want of skill if the case is a new one the patient must trust to the skill and experience of the surgeon he calls so must he if the injury or disease is attended with injury to other parts or other diseases have developed themselves for which there is no established mode of treatment but when the case is one as to which a system of treatment has been followed for a long time there should be no departure from it unless the surgeon who does it is prepared to take the risk of establishing by his success the propriety and safety of his experiment this rule protects the community against reckless experiments while it admits the adoption of new remedies and modes of treatment only when their benefits have been demonstrated or where for the necessity of the case the surgeon or physician must be left to the exercise of his own skill and experience physicians are not bound to comply with the demands of the public they may accept or refuse a call but having accepted one must continue in attendance upon the case until recovery unless dismissed or unless he has withdrawn in a proper way even if his services are gratuitous he must continue them until reasonable time has been given to procure other attendance a husband sued a medical man for neglecting to attend his wife according to agreement during childbirth and the jury gave him a verdict of five hundred dollars the court considered that the physician had broken his contract and was liable therefore but reduced the damages to a nominal sum as in an action on contract the husband could not recover for the personal injury and sufferings of the wife if a physician at any time desires to withdraw from a case he must give such reasonable notice as will enable the patient to obtain assistance elsewhere he has a right to withdraw at any time especially with his patient's consent but if he insists upon that assent as a shield from liability for any negligence of which he may have been guilty or for any malpractice committed the patient may show if he can that the consent was obtained by representations that were false and then the consent will be no protection against liability for damage that had occurred before the consent was given while it is quite competent for a physician and his patient to make any agreement they think fit limiting the attendance to a longer or shorter period or to a single visit and while if there is no such limitation the physician can discontinue his attendance at his own pleasure 
after giving reasonable notice of his intention to do so yet if he is sent for at the time of an injury by one whose family physician he has been for years the effect of his responding to the call will be an engagement to attend upon the case so long as it requires attention unless he gives notice to the contrary or is discharged by the patient and he is bound to use ordinary care and skill not only in his attendance but in determining when it may be safely and properly discontinued Ordrenos says a physician cannot abandon a case without due notice to do so would constitute negligence of a grave character and render him answerable for all injuries sustained by the patient in consequence thereof the contract is for the performance of a service of indefinite duration and usually without stipulation for its continuance during any particular period it is plainly a fraud upon the employer to abandon or neglect discharging the trust after having accepted for the acceptance constitutes a promise and a promise is a good foundation upon which to rest a legal obligation if the physician retires from it he can only do so by placing the employer in as good circumstances as he found him and by giving due notice of his intention a medical man is liable to a civil action for injury resulting to a patient upon his negligence or unskilful treatment although the patient neither employed nor was to pay him as baron park said if an apothecary administers improper medicines to his patient or a surgeon unskilfully treats him and thereby injures his health he will be liable to the patient even where the father or friend of the patient may have been the contracting party with the apothecary or surgeon for though no such contract has been made the apothecary if he gave him proper medicines or the surgeon if he took him as a patient and unskilfully treated him would be liable to an action for a misfeasance and as richards c b said from the necessity of the thing the only person who can properly sustain an action for damages for an injury done to the person of a patient is the patient himself for damages could not be given on that account to any other person although the surgeon may have been retained and employed by him to undertake the case. And in this same case, which was an action brought by a husband and a wife for an injury done to the wife, Garrow B. said, In the practice of surgery, the public are exposed to great risks from the number of ignorant persons professing a knowledge of the art, without the least pretensions to the most necessary qualifications and they often inflict very serious injury on those who are so unfortunate as to fall into their hands in cases of the most brutal inattention and neglect the patients would be precluded frequently from seeking damages by course of law if it were necessary to enable them to recover that there would or should have been a previous retainer on their part of the person professing to be able to cure them in all cases of surgeons retained by any public establishments it would happen that the patient would be without redress for it could hardly be expected that the governors of an infirmary should bring an action against the surgeon employed by them to attend the child of poor parents who may have suffered from his negligence and inattention as in the case of an attorney so with a physician it is not every mistake or misapprehension that will make him liable to an action for negligence there is scarcely a case in which a physician is called in in which he may not be charged with culpa levissima or the omission to ward off every possible casualty and if culpa levissima makes him liable then his liability becomes almost coextensive with his practice he is only responsible for culpa levis it must be remembered that the implied liability of a physician or surgeon retained to treat a case professionally extends no further in the absence of a special agreement than that he will indemnify his patient against any injurious consequences resulting from his want of the proper degree of skill care or diligence in the execution of his employment and in an action against the surgeon for malpractice the plaintiff if he shows no injury resulting from negligence or want of skill in the defendant will not be entitled to recover even nominal damages the question whether the physician possessed adequate skill and exercised adequate care is in a case of malpractice for the jury to decide theoretically and we may add literally the jury have the unquestioned right to decide every controverted fact even if its decision may involve the most obtrusively difficult and uncertain questions in the region of scientific inquiry but it is for the judge to determine whether there is or not such evidence as ought reasonably to satisfy the jury that the fact sought to be proved is established 
as lord cairns once put it the judge has to say whether any facts have been established by evidence from which negligence may be reasonably inferred the jury have to say whether from these facts when submitted to them negligence ought to be inferred it is for the judge to say whether the case should or should not be submitted to the jury and the rule is imperative that it should not be unless the evidence be such that therefrom the negligence charged may be reasonably inferred judges are generally desirous of impressing on juries the necessity of construing everything in the most favourable way for the defendant when such actions are brought against a surgeon it is notorious there are many cases in which jurors are not the most dispassionate or most competent persons to try the rights of parties and an action of this kind that is against a surgeon for malpractice comes within this class in such actions the judge should firmly assume the responsibility of determining himself whether sufficient evidence has or has not been given to compel him to leave the case to the jury medical writers speak strongly against such actions one says in the majority of cases these actions are the direct offspring of envy hatred malice and all uncharitableness and when rocked in the cradle of calumny and nursed by the hand of speculation injury is often inflicted upon the character of the physician who is at the same time left without any proper remedy at law the effect also of such suits upon the public mind is apt to be pernicious for success in obtaining damages often stimulates others into a repetition of the experiment and the physician consequently practises his art in chains being perpetually exposed to the risk of a suit which may ruin his reputation as well as his fortune it becomes lawyers therefore to consider when called upon to institute such suits that little value can be placed on the ipsy dixit of a layman sitting as critic upon the professional conduct of a physician and that aside from such personal delinquencies as drunkenness or gross negligence cruelty towards or abandonment of his patient the field in which the physician discharges his professional duties is practically terra incognita to the unlearned and one where no lay critic can follow him the same critic points out that the majority of suits for malpractice have been brought against surgeons and not against physicians failure is rarely excused in a surgeon he is expected to be an adroit medical carpenter who with knife and saw and splint can so reconstruct the fractured or disjointed members of the human body as to leave no mark or line as evidence of their previous disruption on the other hand the physician enshrined within the penetralia of his mystic art and mounted upon a delphic tripod inaccessible to vulgar criticism pronounces his diagnosis and formulizes his prescriptions with unquestioned judgment his diagnosis may be faulty his medicines ill-selected or ill-timed in their administration and still no blame be incurred by him for any evil consequences that may ensue for who will presume to say in case of, of the patient's death that he had not naturally reached that last illness foreordained to all men and of which the physician's unsuccessful treatment is only official testimony who knows in fact when a man has reached his last illness till he dies and as a corollary to this strange as it may seem one might through unskilfulness sacrifice a human life with more impunity than he could mutilate or deform a toe or finger the question of the amount of damages for personal injuries arising from malpractice is one resting a good deal in the discretion of the jury and must of necessity be more or less uncertain the party must recover all his damages present and prospective in one action if the damages are so excessive as to strike all mankind at first blush as beyond all measure unreasonable and outrageous and such as manifestly show the jury to have been actuated by passion partiality corruption or prejudice the court will grant a new trial sometimes however courts have granted new trials for excessive damages where the excessiveness has fallen short of this in considering what should be taken into account by a jury estimating the amount of damages to be awarded the american courts have held that the loss of time caused by the injury is to be considered also the age and situation in life of the injured one the expenses incurred the permanent effect upon the plaintiff's capacity to pursue his professional calling or to support himself as before times are essential factors bodily pain too is to be considered and compensated for and so much of mental suffering as may be indivisibly connected with it 
but mental anguish and agony cannot be measured by money, the courts consider, and there is no established rule authoritatively commanding such a futile effort. In fact, the courts say that one should get compensation for all the injuries that are the legal, direct and necessary results of the malpractice. The late case of Phillips and the South Western Railway Company fully enunciates what, in the estimation of the English judges, are to be considered in fixing the damages. Cockburn C.J. said that the heads of damages were the bodily injuries sustained, the pain undergone, the effect on the health of the sufferer, according to its degree and its probable duration as likely to be temporary or permanent, the expenses incidental to attempt to effect a cure, and the pecuniary loss sustained through inability to attend to a professional business. In the Court of Appeal, Bramwell L.J. remarked, You must give the plaintiff a compensation for his pecuniary loss. You must give him compensation for his pain and bodily suffering. Of course, it is almost impossible to give an injured man what can be strictly called compensation, but you must take a reasonable view of the case and must consider, under all the circumstances, what is a fair amount to be awarded to him. Phillips, who was a physician of middle age and robust health, making £5,000 a year, was so injured by a railway company that he was totally unable to attend his business. His life was a burden and a source of utmost pain, and the probability was that he would never recover. The jury gave him £16,000, and the court refused to consider it excessive. A physician who has received personal injuries may recover damages for loss of business as a physician, although he has not such a degree as would entitle him to maintain an action for professional services. The value of the fees which he would have received without suit may be estimated. An action cannot be maintained against the representatives of a deceased surgeon to recover damages arising from the unskillful treatment of a patient. Such actions do not survive. A medical practitioner who causes the death of a patient by such malpractice or negligence as would have entitled the patient, if death had not ensued, to maintain an action and recover damages against him in respect of the injuries sustained thereby, is liable to an action for damages notwithstanding the death of the patient, and although the circumstances under which the death was caused amount to felony. Such action may be brought for the benefit of the wife, husband, parent and child of the deceased, and the jury may give such damages as they may think proportion to the injury resulting from such death to the parties respectively for whom and for whose benefit such action is brought. But such injury must be a pecuniary loss, and the jury may not give damages as a solatium. In some of the American cases, the mental anguish caused by the injury has been taken into account in estimating the damages to be given. Not more than one action, however, will lie for and in respect of the same subject matter of complaint, and every such action must be commenced within twelve months after the death of the person injured. End of section 5. Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia. Chapter 6 of The Law and Medical Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia. The Law and Medical Men by Robert Vachon Rogers, Chapter 6. Chapter 6. Criminal Malpractice. Whenever death ensues as the alleged consequence of malpractice, it becomes necessary to inquire into the conduct of the physician, so as to determine how far his want of skill or negligence has conspired to produce it. The offence may, under certain circumstances, indicating a wanton and malicious disregard of human life, amount to murder. Of course, a medical practitioner who should intentionally and with malice cause the death of a patient would be held guilty of this crime. But in no case will an indictment for murder lie unless there be a felonious destruction of life, with malice either expressed or implied. If a patient die from want of competent skill or sufficient attention, the practitioner is guilty of manslaughter. If one that is of the mystery of a physician take upon him the cure of a man, 
and giveth him such physic so as to dieth thereof without any felonious intent and against his will it is no homicide so saith my lord cook blackstone says this is neither murder nor manslaughter but misadventure and he shall not be punished criminally on the one hand we must be careful and most anxious to prevent people from tampering in physic so as to trifle with the life of man and on the other hand we must take care not to charge criminally a person who is of general skill because he has been unfortunate in a particular case it is god who gives man only administers medicine and the medicine that the most skilful may administer may not be productive of the expected effect but it would be a dreadful thing if a man were to be called in question criminally whenever he happened to miscarry in his practice it would be most fatal to the efficiency of the medical profession if no one could administer medicine without a halter round his neck at one time it was held that if one not a regular physician or surgeon should administer a medicine or perform an operation with a fatal effect it would be manslaughter at the least but long since by sir matthew hale one of the greatest judges that ever adorned the english bench this doctrine was questioned now however both in england and america it is well settled that it makes no difference whether the party be a regular practitioner or not if he bona fide and honestly exercising his best skill to cure a patient performs an operation or administers a medicine which causes the patient's death he is not guilty of manslaughter god forbid saith lord hale that any mischance of this kind should make a person not licensed guilty of murder or manslaughter this doctrine that if any one dies under the hand of an unlicensed physician it is felony is apocryphal and fitted i fear to gratify and flatter doctors and licentiates in physic though it may have its use to make people cautious and wary how they take upon themselves too much in this dangerous employment hullock b remarked that it would be most dangerous for it to get abroad that if an operation should fail the surgeon would be liable to be prosecuted for manslaughter and as to making a difference between regular and irregular practitioners the same learned judge aptly put it in remote parts of the country many persons would be left to die if irregular surgeons were not allowed to practice or as another judge put it we should have many of the poorer sort of people die for want of help lest their intended helpers might miscarry lord lyndhurst agrees with the rule but makes an exception he says i agree that in these cases there is no difference between a licensed physician or surgeon and a person acting as a physician or surgeon without a license in either case if a party having a competent degree of skill and knowledge makes an accidental mistake in the treatment of a patient through which mistake death ensues he is not thereby guilty of manslaughter but if where proper medical assistance can be had a person totally ignorant of the science of medicine takes on himself to administer a violent and dangerous remedy to one labouring under disease and death ensues in consequence of that dangerous remedy having been so administered then he is guilty of manslaughter webb a publican had given large doses of morrison's pills to one ill of smallpox if any one whether he be a regular or licensed medical man or not professes to deal with the life or health of others he is bound to have competent skill to perform the task that he holds himself out to perform and he is bound to treat his patient with care attention and assiduity and if the patient dies for want of either the practitioner is guilty of manslaughter every person who enters into a learned profession undertakes to bring to the exercise of it a reasonable degree of care and skill and if a medical man though lawfully qualified to act as such cause the death of a person by the grossly unskilful or grossly incautious use of a dangerous instrument he is guilty of manslaughter no one is justified in making use of an instrument in itself a dangerous one unless he does so with a proper degree of skill and caution there must be competent knowledge and care in dealing with a dangerous drug if a man is ignorant of the nature of the drug he uses or is guilty of gross want of care in its use it would be criminal culpability in iowa it was held that one assuming to act as a physician who treats a patient in good faith and to the best of his ability is not criminally responsible for the death of his patient caused by the medicine he administers to substantiate the charge of manslaughter 
the prisoner must have been guilty of criminal misconduct, arising either from the grossest ignorance or the most criminal inattention. One or other of these is necessary to make him guilty of that criminal negligence and misconduct which is essential to make out a case of manslaughter. Thus Lord Ellenborough laid down the law in the case of a man midwife, who was on trial for murder by malpractice. Long since in the mirror, it was said, if physicians or chirurgeons take upon them a cure, and have no knowledge or skill therein, or if they have knowledge, if nevertheless they neglect the cure, or minister that which is cold for hot, or take little care thereof, or neglect due diligence therein, and especially in burning and cutting off members, which they are forbidden to do, but at the peril of their patient, if their patients die or lose their members, in such cases they are manslayers or mayhem doors. Park J. charged the jury very similarly in one of St. John Long's celebrated cases. If, said his lordship, you think there was gross ignorance or scandalous inattention in the conduct of the prisoner, then you will find him guilty. If you do not think so, then your verdict will be otherwise. Wharton considers that the position assumed by Lord Ellenborough depends upon the honesty and bona fides of the practitioner, and that if he is pursuing a plan of bold imposture, the law would be otherwise. In Long's case, Baron Garrow said, I make no distinction between the person who consults the most eminent physician and the cases of those whose necessities or whose folly may carry them into any other quarter. It matters not whether the individual consulted be the president of the College of Surgeons or the humblest bone-setter of the village, but, be it one or the other, he ought to bring into the case ordinary skill and diligence. I am of the opinion that if a person who has ever so much or so little skill sets my leg and does it as well as he can and does it badly, he is excused. But suppose the person comes drunk and gives me a tumbler full of laudanum and sends me into the other world. Is it not manslaughter? And why is that? Because I have a right to have reasonable care and caution. In a subsequent case against the same practitioner, Bailey B. said to the jury, I have no hesitation in saying for your guidance that if a man be guilty of gross neglect in attending to his patient after he has applied a remedy, or of gross rashness in the application of it, and death ensues in consequence, he will be liable to a conviction for manslaughter. I consider rashness will be sufficient to make it manslaughter, as, for instance, if I have the toothache, and a person undertakes to cure it by administering laudanum, and says, I have no notion how much will be sufficient, but gives me a cupful, which immediately kills. Or if a person prescribing James's powder says, I have no notion how much should be taken, and yet gives one a tablespoonful, which has the same effect. Such persons, acting with rashness, will, in my opinion, be guilty of manslaughter. A prosecution is for the public benefit, and the willingness of the patient cannot take away the offence against the public. The matter has been well put in a Missouri case. If, said the judge, the party prescribing has so much knowledge of the fatal tendency of the prescription that it may reasonably be presumed that he administered the medicine from an obstinate and willful rashness, and not from an honest intention and expectation of effecting a cure, he is guilty of manslaughter at least, though he might not have intended any bodily harm to the patient. It is the presence of intention which determines the moral complexion of an action, and whenever this intention, always presumed to be good, is proved to be bad, then, and then only, does a physician become criminally responsible for his wrongdoings. Doubtless a bad intention may be at times inferred from the character of the misconduct, and neglect, particularly when gross, may be classed among those reasons which justify such an inference. What the law deems gross negligence has thus been defined in a case where a herbalist was on trial for manslaughter, for the death of a patient through an overdose of colchium seeds and brandy for a cold. Gross negligence might be of two kinds. In one sense, where a man, for instance, went hunting and neglected his patient, who died in consequence. Another sort of gross negligence consisted in rashness, where a person was not sufficiently skilled in dealing with dangerous medicines which should be carefully used, of the properties of which he was ignorant, or how to administer a proper dose. A person who, with ignorant rashness and without skill in his profession, used such a dangerous medicine, acted with gross negligence. 
It was not, however, every slip that a man might make that rendered him liable to a criminal investigation. It must be a substantial thing. If a man knew that he was using medicines beyond his knowledge and was meddling with things above his reach, that was culpable rashness. Negligence might consist in using medicines in the use of which care was required and of the properties of which the person using them was ignorant. A person who so took a leap in the dark in the administration of medicines was guilty of gross negligence. If a man was wounded and another man applied to his wound sulfuric acid or something which was of a dangerous nature and ought not to be applied and which led to fatal results, then the person who applied this remedy would be answerable and not the person who inflicted the wound because a new cause had supervened. But if the person who dressed the wound applied a proper remedy, then if a fatal result ensued, he who inflicted the wound remained liable. In these words, Willers J charged the jury and they, after a long deliberation, brought in a verdict of not guilty. And in the very recent case of State and Hardister, it was held that a physician is criminally liable for his gross ignorance causing the death of his patient, but not for a mere mistake of judgment. However, in the celebrated case against the father and founder of the botanic or steam system of medicine, whose favourite remedies were coffee, well my gristle, and ram cats, it was held that if a person assuming to be a physician, through gross ignorance, but honestly and bona fide, administers medicine which causes the death of the patient, he is not guilty of manslaughter. This was in the year 1809, and the doctrine laid down was followed in 1844 in Missouri, in an exactly similar case, and quite recently in Iowa, where one Schultz was tried for manslaughter because his patient died under the Bounshide practice, that is, pricking the body and rubbing in a certain kind of oil, the court on review said in 2 Bishop's Criminal Law, 4th edition, section 695, the law upon this subject is declared as follows. From the relationship of physician and patient, the death of the latter not infrequently arises. On this subject, the doctrine seems to have been held that whenever one undertakes to cure another of disease or to perform on him a surgical operation, he renders himself thereby liable to the criminal law, if he does not carry to his duty some degree of skill, though what degree may not be clear. Consequently, if the patient dies through his ill treatment, he is indictable for manslaughter. On the other hand, a more humane doctrine is laid down, that since it is lawful and commendable for one to cure another, if he undertakes this office in good faith and adopts the treatment he deems best, he is not liable to be adjudged a felon, though the treatment should be erroneous, and in the eyes of those who assume to know all about this subject, which in truth is understood by no mortal, grossly wrong, and though he is a person called, by those who deem themselves wise, grossly ignorant of medicine and surgery. The former doctrine seems to be the English one, and so in England a person, whether a licensed medical practitioner or not, who undertakes to deal with the life or health of people, is bound to have competent skill or suffer criminally for the defect. Now, if a man thinks he has competent skill and makes no misrepresentation to his patients concerning the amount or kind of medical education actually received by himself, he seems in reason to stand on exactly the foundation occupied by every person who honestly undertakes medical practice after full advantages, so far as concerns his state of mind, and it is the mind to which we look in questions of legal guilt. Any person undertaking a cure but being grossly careless and thus producing death is for a different reason liable to a charge of manslaughter, whether he is a licensed practitioner or not. These cases seem to us to announce a correct rule. The interests of society will be subserved by holding a physician civilly liable in damages for the consequences of his ignorance without imposing upon him criminal liability when he acts with good motives and honest intentions. If the death of a man has been accelerated by the want of due skill and competency, or by the carelessness of his physician, the latter cannot defend himself by proving that his patient was afflicted with a mortal disease. If a man who has received a serious wound is placed under the charge of a surgeon, 
who, in probing the wound or otherwise operating on the patient, immediately causes his death, then, if the surgeon has acted negligently or maliciously, he is indictable for the homicide, and the original assailant only for an attempt. But if the surgeon, using due skill and care, occasions death while he is endeavouring to heal the wound, then he who inflicted the wound is chargeable with the death, for he who does an unlawful act is responsible for all the consequences that in the ordinary course of events flow from it. It is an ordinary consequence of a wound that a surgeon should be called in to attend to it, and it is a necessary incident of surgery that patients should die under the knife. It is no defence, where a death is not shown to have been produced by the medical attendant's negligence, that the deceased might have recovered if a higher degree of professional skill had been employed. If a person is assailed by a fatal disease and there is no escape from it, save by a dangerous surgical operation, then, if he gives his free and intelligent consent to the operation, and it is skilfully performed, the surgeon cannot be blamed even though the patient perish under the knife. The German jurists go still further and say, Suppose a dangerous operation is required as the last hope of resuscitating an unconscious person. If the operation is performed with the skill usual to surgeons under such circumstances, and death ensue, the surgeon is blameless. If a woman is in such a state of labour that her life can only be preserved by the sacrifice of that of the child, then it is not only the right but the duty of the attendant to save the mother at the expense of the babe. Wharton says that this proposition is indisputable. From the leading cases, the following propositions may be extracted, say Wharton and Stilly, section 1063. 1. If the defendant acted honestly and used his best skill to cure, and it does not appear that he thrust himself in the place of a competent person, it makes no difference whether he was at the time a regular physician or surgeon or not. 2. To constitute guilt, gross ignorance or negligence must be proved. 3. A defendant who with competent knowledge makes a mistake in a remedy is not answerable but it is otherwise when a violent remedy shown to have occasioned death is administered by a person grossly ignorant but with average capacity, in which case malice is presumed, in the same way that it is presumed when a man, compus mentis, lets loose a mad bull into a thoroughfare, or casts down a log of wood on a crowd. 4. Where competent medical aid can be had, the application of violent remedies by an ignorant person, though with the best motives, involves him in criminal responsibility. 5. Express malice or an intent to commit a personal or social wrong makes the practitioner criminally responsible in all cases of mischief. These well-known writers say that according to Caspar and Berker, in the treatment of internal diseases, the physician can never be held guilty of criminal carelessness for failing to use any particular remedy, since there is never any remedy upon which all authorities are agreed, and since it is always possible the patient may recover without the use of such remedy. End of chapter 6. Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia.